alle hier so geliebe Boden Papineski. Papineski. Right. Is, look, for, for How I do it? I'm very open minded. If you're okay, we do the Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, it seem, seems to be seems to be working. We're running five minutes uh, late, but still relatively on time. Let's say. Uh, apologies for the slight confusion into which se this session was. It actually in this room and not uh, and not downstairs. So just as a reminder, this is a session here on the EU resource management aspects, whereas the just transition session is happening in the main auditorium below. So just in case you're in the not in the session you wanted to attend. A fair warning. So, continuing with our program for the day at our Think 2030 conference, I'm here with a wonderful set of panelists to discuss, as I've just mentioned, EU resource management. Uh, we have a presentation to start with by our colleague Emma Watkins, to whom I will give the floor in a, in a second, so I will not be speaking too long. Just reminding ourselves that the extraction, the use, the discarding of material resources make a significant contribution to the critical environmental problem that we face today. This triple crisis is often mentioned, the climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. We have, and by we, I will stop using we, I promise, the EU's material footprint sat at 14.5 tons per capita in 2022. That is around double the estimated sustainable level, meaning that the EU consumes far more than its fair share of the world's resources in a nutshell. Furthermore, in 2022 again, the EU's economy was only on 11.5 circular. That means we remain somewhat stuck in a linear model of production, consumption, waste. And this is a significant untapped potential for circularity. It's therefore time for the EU to take greater steps toward more sustainable management and use of resources at the head of this should be an overarching ambition to use fewer material resources whilst continuing to meet the needs of the EU and its people. And this represents a significant challenge, as we've already mentioned in several of our conversations since the beginning of the day. The shift to a cleaner, greener, more circular economy requires access to the materials needy, needed for the new transition, the so-called green and digital twin transition. And these there's associated increased demand for those materials. So these are also some of the topics that we will be covering today. That means profound economic shifts and change in production and consumption methods that will be needed in various industries, various sectors, to ensure that the EU's climate and circular economy targets are met. So what can actually be done at the EU level? This panel will provide an opportunity to discuss different policy approaches, both path and potential in the future, that could be taken, including the introduction of a new overarching EU material resource law with a headline consumption reduction target. We will be discussing that option. The panels and participants in the sessions will be invited to share their views on how resource consumption could be reduced whilst ensuring that potential negative impacts on various actors are minimized. This serves as a setting the scene, but without further ado, I would like to give the floor to my colleague Emma Watkins, who will give a short presentation on the issues that at stake. Thank you very much. Thank you, Antoine, for the uh, introduction. Um, I'm going to be sitting at a slightly strange angle, so apologies so that I can see the slides at the same time. Um, so, um, yeah, Antoine's already covered, I think, some of the key points on this slide uh, in his introductory remarks. Uh, but basically, the session is to discuss the need to address resource use in the EU. Um, so, obviously, the uh, extraction, use, and discarding of material resources makes a major contribution to the, the key uh, 
environmental challenges of, of today, so of climate change, pollution, and biodiversity loss. Um, as Janis, I think, also mentioned this morning, um, the EU has already been measured to have exceeded uh, five planetary boundaries, uh, so those for the use of mineral and metal resources, uh, but also for climate change, for use of fossil fuel-based products, uh, particulate matter, and for ecotoxicity in fresh water. So there's a lot of uh, environmental challenges there that, that need to be dealt with. Um, I skip the next two points since Antoine already summarised those in his introductory remarks. Uh, and then just to note that obviously the, the high material resource use levels in the EU pose a risk to some of the EU's key uh, policy and uh, legislative objectives. Uh, so these include the Green Deal's objectives to become a climate neutral, resource efficient and competitive economy. Uh, and also for the attainment of the goals of the uh, European Climate Law and the Circular Economy Action Plan. Um, so why is now the right time to, to discuss this and the right time for the EU to try to take action? Um, sustainable resource use is increasingly uh, on the policy agenda um, globally at the EU level and also at the member state level. Uh, so there's obviously the UN SDG uh, 12, which is to ensure sustainable consumption and production patterns. Uh, the I IRP's uh, recent report, which came out uh, at the start of this month, which I'm sure uh, Janis will uh, speak about in his uh, uh, presentation. Uh, there's also um, last week's EEA report on accelerating circular economy in Europe, which uh, additionally recognises the need to reduce the currently unsustainable uh, product consumption. Um, and there's also um, a manifesto, a sufficiency manifesto that was published by a, a large group of NGOs, I think, this week, uh, which is also calling for um, reduction targets for energy consumption and material footprint. So there's a lot of this kind of discourse happening at the moment. Um, some member states are already beginning to set their own national material resource consumption targets um, to reduce uh, resource consumption. Uh, so, for example, in Austria, there's a target to reduce material footprint by 80% to around 7 tonnes per capita by 2050. Uh, Flanders also has a, a similar target of 75% by 2050. Uh, and the Netherlands has a material use a reduction target of 50% by 2030. Um, there's also the European Critical Raw Materials Act, which obviously highlights the need the need for continued access to key material, re material resources uh, to support the, the green transition, the energy transition. So materials are still needed, but there are gaps uh, within that um, act in relation to um, sustainability and making sure that the resources are obtained in a sustainable way. Um, we've actually, uh, within IEP, uh, currently concluding some work for Citra, who are also on the, the panel today, uh, looking in particular at the Critical Raw Materials Act, so looking at, for example, circularity gaps, um, external supply-related uh, issues, uh, extraction of material-related issues, and resource management. So that's also an interesting uh, factor to, to consider, perhaps, in the discussion. Um, so what can actually be done at the EU level? Uh, this is kind of the, the main focus, hopefully, of today's discussion. Um, these uh, suggestions are based on a report that uh, IEP um, contributed to uh, with Tulip Consulting for OVAM, so for the uh, Flemish uh, Public Waste Agency, which was concluded towards the end of last year. Um, the report is available both on the OVAM website and our own website, so you can uh, feel free to, to go and have a read of that afterwards. Uh, but we suggest that we need an EU resource law uh, in a similar kind of framing to the EU climate law, so an overarching objective to really kind of drive ambition uh, and action. Um, we think it should contain a, a headline material resource consumption reduction target, uh, which includes uh, as many types of materials as possible. So we suggest it should include biomass, fossil fuels, uh, minerals, and metals to encompass the, the majority of resource use. Um, we believe that target can also then be broken down into material-specific targets and sector-specific targets with indicators to, to measure the progress that's being made to ensure that, that progress is being made. Um, and... Obviously, it's, it's quite easy to say that this needs to be done, but there's a lot of discussion that, that needs to happen and also a lot of work to be done on the practical implementation of such a target. Uh, so we suggest a kind of similar set of measures to those in the climate law. 
Um, so an independent scientific advisory body on, on material resources to, to you know, bring the science that's needed to the discussion. Um, then we also suggest that member states uh, should develop their own national plans on how they can contribute to the, the overall reduction target. Um, some sort of effort sharing system between member states, um, again, uh, as is the case with climate, and then also uh, the development of sector specific plans to, to tackle the, the kind of sectoral uh, side of things. Um, so that's our proposal in a very brief uh, nutshell. Um, I hand back to Antoine to, to moderate the session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma, for this uh, reminder and this outline of this uh, report that we've uh, published with the support of um, OVAM at the, towards the end of last year. And again, trying to be realistic and strategic into how we approach EU resource uh, management at, uh, in terms of policy making. Without further ado, let's expert, it's other experts talk, and I turn myself now to, the, uh, to our great panelists for the day. So, we're joined today with Lasse Mitinin, from, who is the Director of Sustainability Solutions at the Finnish Innovation Fund, Citra, with whom we've been working on for quite some time, actually, on the matters related to, to circular economy. Janes Podrosnik, uh, whom you've uh, heard already uh, since the beginning of the day, who's co-chair of the International Resource Panel. Bram Sonnen, who's a representative, who's a senior expert in product policy and representative of the Belgian presidency of the council. Nazare Kuto from Sense, from Portugal, who's a member also of the Think Sustainable Europe Network, the network of think tanks that IP is coordinating within the, uh, within the EU. And Joe Papineski, who's the chairperson of Unomia Research and Consulting, a think tank by, uh, focusing, among others, on circular economy uh, matters. So first of all, thank you very much for joining, and let's get started. I've prepared a few questions for you. Don't worry, they're easy. And I would like to start with you, Lasse, actually with a very, very easy one. <laughs> Citra has worked for years on the transition toward a circular economy that addresses our unsustainable, unsustainable resource use levels. So tell us, if you could tell us, how do we transform the European economy from the old linear model to a true circular economy? Thank you. That was a sort of a very concise way to form a uh, very big issue. Uh, let me first uh, start by saying it's such a pleasure to be here at this, at this conference and panel discussing this uh, vital topic. Um, Citra, we at Citra, the Finnish Innovation Fund, we indeed have been working for years for the circular economy transition, recognizing that uh, as there's an urgent need to combine the different strands of ecological sustainability work, combining the climate work, the biodiversity work, the natural resources, the materials use work, the pollution work, uniting them into a single stream where we recognize that the ecological crisis facing Earth and humanity is one, as nature is one, and thus our response to the crisis ought to be one, too. And, uh, the circular economy is an interesting uh, issue in this because it's a concept that enables us to tackle all simultaneously, drive both uh, while, while driving materials use benefit benefits it give leverages also climate benefits, biodiversity benefits, and employment be jobs benefits, competitiveness benefits, welfare benefits, and in this era of growing geopolitical, geopolitical tensions, also strategic autonomy benefits, for instance, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, critical raw materials. But uh, to make a long story short, uh, while we, uh, the, the last decade we first helped Finland formulate the first national circular economy roadmap, uh, in the last few years our thinking has focused very much on the question of how to transform, the, you, how to use the single market as a tool for circular economy transition, how to create a true circular single market, as if, as, as if we want to scale up the markets, for instance, for European companies delivering circular solutions, where having 27 separate markets is not the way to do that. If we want to leverage the full potential that the single market gives to actually scale things up and boost 
boost both supply and demand side of circular sol solutions to act actually leave behind the old linear ways and embrace the circular ways of doing that, then we need to have the circular, uh, the single market as an instrument for that. And uh, well, to succeed in that, we have so far identified six key policy levers, uh, which we need to push at the same time. And uh, they might be no-brainers to people who have been invo involved in these topics uh, for a long while, but to go through them really quickly. First of all, uh, we need to increase the required level of recycled content. That's for sure needed to boost the demand for recycled materials. And the EU battery regulation has already pioneered the way in this. And from the batteries, we need to pr move on and expand to other relevant product groups. But then the second point, um, I, guess, I think we all recognize that if we look at only the end of life phase of products, we are fighting a losing battle. We have to start looking at the beginning, at the design phase of products. And that's where we are going with the Eco Design for Sustainable Products Regulation, uh, which is a cornerstone in this, and making sure that the products that we create are made to be lasting and repairable and recyclable. So that's, that's number two, the European, European product policy to ensure we tackle the design phase of products, not just the end of life phase. And the third policy lever, uh, if we want to achieve a true European single, circular single market, we need European standards and definitions for circularity. For instance, for end of waste criteria, when does a thing cease to be accounted for as waste and starts to be taken as a resource? to be used again. If with, without consensus on that and shared standard and definition, we will have 20, 27 versions of circularity instead of one. And fourthly, public procurement. Us spending two trillion euros per year on public procurement, we have a huge tool at our disposal. And uh, using the green public procurement criteria that uh, already are experimented with, as a tool to drive effective, coordinated European measures to uh, accelerate circular solutions, materials, products, and services, that would be a game changer. Driving, boosting demand. There are so many small and medium-sized enterprises out there with circular solutions already existing, but they need, need the ones to, that, uh, they, 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 they need the first demonstrations that allow them to go on and scale. And uh, point number five, we need to combine the materials or the ecological transition with the digital transition, as already remarked in the preliminary remarks. We need to get the data flowing in the circular value chain, for instance, with the digital product passports, which are, of course, part of the toolbox of the European product policy to ensure that the data of the contents, the materials of the product, how to repair, how to reuse, how to recycle it, flows from one company in the value chain to the next company, uh, enabling it to boost its business model to actually recycle the stuff or repair it or reuse it. You need the data for that. And we have to ensure we have European mechanisms for the data sharing. And digital product passports are probably the right tool for that. And uh, last but not least, we, of course, need to shift the tax base. As the World Bank already remarked a few years ago, the circular economy is growing fast, but the, the old linear economy is growing far, even faster because all the, uh, the playing field is not level. It's heavily slanted towards favoring the linear economy. And we need to change that. Shifting the tax base from, shift, from taxing labor to taxing materia raw materials use from taxing services to taxing uh, materials intensive products and so on. And that takes some doing as taxation is the privilege of the member states, but we still need a coordinated European response for that if we want to level the playing field throughout the single market. I could go on and on with this, so a, a favorite topic of mine, but I shan't do that, but I will leave, leave the floor to others. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lasse. And I'm sure we'll have some time to get back to one of the six points that you've uh, mentioned. Thank you so much for actually condensing such a large issue into six 
bullet points. I mean, that makes my job extremely easier, so thank you for that. Uh, Yannis, if I can turn to, to you now. The International Resource Panel, so I've, has been mentioned, published its Global Resources Outlook 2024 reports. Uh, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. Uh, you probably know about this report. If you don't, if you have one report to read this week, this month, make it this one. It's an absolutely great one, and it comes with several key findings that I'm sure you will um, highlight. But I wanted to notably mention the one that resource use has vastly increased in the past decades. It's forecasted to continue to do so, and this is the main driver of the triple planetary crisis. So essentially here we're talking about the cause and not the symptoms. So, Janice, if you please. Can I take yours? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, first of all, and uh, if I start from basically where the presentation was and just to comment some of the things. You were basically talking, if you would use the IRP terminology about the uh, materials law, not resources law. Because, because when we say materials, uh, so the first point which I want to do, it's about terminology, which I think it's important. So when we say materials, we say everything extracted from the earth. So that's exactly the four components which you mentioned, biomass, metals, non-metallic minerals, and fossil fuels. And then we are normally adding water and land and that constitutes resources. But if you want to use the word resources, you could say resources extracted and processed from the earth because they are resources, uh, obviously. So I think that's quite important. And also, when you talk about uh, circularity, it's the same mess which we are in, if we are honest. Because it's, if I would just explain you where the Europe went through, uh, because somehow I started the process that was 2010-11, uh, it was with the, uh, with the um, resource efficiency. We started with that concept, basically, and trying to, and if I would explain you why resource efficiency was the concept on which we focused, you would not believe me. Uh, it's, the reason is that we were split from the climate, and we needed to find our own narrative, because before climate was taking all the room in environment, and uh, we find the new narrative in resource management. So uh, that's, that's how it actually emerged on the scene. And from resource management, we actually went 2014 then to, uh, to the first circular economy package. But we have actually abused because we were forced to do the, the renewal of the waste legislation. So the first package was very much, was very much waste related circular economy story. And uh, uh, commission has des then nicely um, moved to the next level, which is now product circular economy story. But they are not yet on system change circular story. So that's where we are approximately. And that's where we will hopefully go. But this is more difficult area, because when you go to systems, you, you fundamentally need to go to, to other colleagues and you, you can't manage that by environmental, uh, just portfolio looking. On the circularity uh, and on the measurements, by the way, uh, I think we all have to understand why, why we do what we do. So everything at the end is like you said, it's about impact. So that's, that's the whole reason, otherwise we would not be sitting in the room. So it's uh, all the triple planetary crisis and we could basically add some additional crisis and to water, land and so on. But let's talk about triple. And uh, when we talk about scientific concept, which is basically linked to circularity, it's decoupling. Yeah? So that's the whole idea to decouple economic basically the well-being growth from the resource use and environmental impacts. And when you talk about circularity, and then when you mention, for example, figures which are, we are going up or down with circularity, uh, my serious only measurement about are we successful with circularity or not, it's, uh, is the coupling happening or not? Because at the end of the day, that's what we want to achieve. You know? So I think it would be really important that when in future we look to that, that we look through that uh, optic also. Uh, now, second point, which I want to do, there are three points. Second is, uh, why actually materials are, are on the agenda? Because, by the way, I was fighting 
all my years that they would get on the agenda. But whenever you spoke in anybody in the commission or outside of the commission, whenever I was saying uh, we need to look to resource efficiency and blah, 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 yes, 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 resource efficiency, it's important. Energy efficiency, that was the second sentence. Mm -hmm. So it was immediately energy. And by the way, materials are on the agenda because of energy. They are not on the agenda because somebody suddenly gets so smart that it would understand that it, they matter. No, it is critical raw materials which are needed for energy transition. And that's why they are on the agenda. And when I, again, if I return to, to, to old years, whenever I've heard critical raw materials and as environment commissioner, I get nervous because this is purely economic concept. So it's about all materials which you have to, to care about, which you have to use more smartly. And, but with that, that they are coming on the, agenda, on the agenda, actually it's our time, fine. So finally they have arrived in our house. So it's good. Uh, uh, one thing which I would like to be very clear about critical raw materials and the whole, by the way, energy story will get terribly, terribly difficult, in particular because AI recommendations for energy are enormous. I have seen uh, the, some latest uh, estimates that for AI just to run the system in US, they will need more electricity than for all mobility transformation. So the data figures, approximately, that you will see, which means that this kind of um, dependence on electrification will get harder, more difficult to manage and everything. And uh, when they are searching for an answer, because this is very much part of critical raw materials answer, it's recycling increase. But let me tell you, the definition of critical raw materials is that we will need enormously more of them and that the gap exists. If it's that curve, you know. So we are here and this is the recycling potential in 10 years, here. And these are the needs. So recycling will not solve that question. Recycling is solving the question when you have stabilized needs, could solve it. If that's not that I would say any word against recycling, by the way. I'm just telling you it will not solve the critical raw material story. So the only way to actually address it is going back to the, those systems which are most resource intensive, mobility, uh, housing, uh, uh, food, and, and energy. So that, that's basically the second point. And the third point, which I want to do, actually, there are four. OK. <laughs> Rethinking the, this one is very short. Rethinking the governance structure, which, uh, which is actually the point which you have done. In IRP, we are dreaming about that for quite a long, you know, because actually we would like to be more impactful than we are. We don't have our own convention. And uh, I have given up the dreams that we would have our own convention, even if I think it would be good. But uh, what we are trying to push now is that at least we would get an international body who would deal with those questions in an organized way. That's why uh, we have talked a lot at UNIA down there about uh, international resource agency, something like we have in energy, you know. And even that, it's, uh, it, it's immediate reaction by everybody, it's ooh, not another international agency. So it will be quite hard right. I'm just trying to tell you that international community, it's pretty much rigid for anything new in including this, even if they are slightly, slowly, steadily getting it, that that's the game. So that's where you have to go. And uh, I think they are at least open to that. And finally, about the target story. Uh, I, I will not, uh, material footprint, if you will give me later on three minutes, I will explain you because there are really some super interesting findings about material footprint in the recent uh, uh, report. Basically, we can actually prove that the coupling is happening in high-income countries. But uh, there are some other things, but I will not go into detail there. So we are struggling ourselves with uh, setting, uh, setting targets. Again, it's, uh, uh, by the way, in, the, in my first proposal, 2014, there was already the proposal that we should set target, but it was uh, relative uh, uh, 30% increase of resource efficiency at that time, whatever. 
So we are, we are struggling, so we don't have a scientific consensus, really, about. And slowly, slowly, we are getting somewhere. While our report is full of material footprint, when we talk about past, when we talk about future, it's difficult to get consensus because uh, there are clear scientific claims, and they are quite substantiated, that, of course, some of the materials do prevail in certain phases of development. And uh, in particular, non-metallic minerals are in countries which are today building cities, uh, infrastructure pretty much skyrocketing. And they consider it it's a bit uh, unfair. But in saturated societies, they are extremely fair, you know, like we are. So for in Europe, you have uh, European Union, it's 14.5. We have Europe, as, which is probably a bit different geographical, and it's 17. But for North America, believe it or not, it's 30 tons per capita. And standard, it's not very much different in Europe and in North America. Yeah? So it's possible to do it differently. And that's why today I was talking about sufficiency from the resource side, not from the, you know, we can meet the same human needs with 30 or with 17, obviously. So that's, that's where it's, it's obviously a room of maneuver where actually you don't challenge consumers that they have to use less. No. They, they would get the same satisfaction, but with a bit more non-insane system like it's currently prevailing. So, yeah, you could talk about uh, that specific, like, uh, like you mentioned in the beginning. So, but for any specific target which you want to actually, uh, you need the whole scientific process, frankly, because everything else is not solid. So you need, and I'm, of course, most... Uh, uh, in favor of, because I was in policy making and I know exactly how much an aggregate target would do. So I don't care really if we miss it a bit up and down. I would like that it's a driver of a process. Like it's 1.5. By the way, we have surpassed already 1.5. Nobody's panicking, as I said. But it has at least created a process. And I firmly believe that this material story and without that story, we will not handle never climate change. And, and we need on this supply and demand, on the top we need also nature-based solutions, which again we are not using properly yet. So I think that the whole story of energy-only solution has after two, three decades leading us to conclusion, no, it's not sufficient. I'm not saying it's not working, but it's obviously not sufficient. And I think it is time to think about materials. Thank you so much, Ines, for reminding us of some of the, of the realities we are dealing with here. Is that there's a kind of a focus that's been happening from an energy slash CRM's perspective, narrowing down the debate away from the much larger conception of what materials are and what kind of impact they can, uh, they can have. And the, the understanding that we can have on the notion of targets. I've mentioned the 14.5 and saying that it's double what is arguably what's potentially considered what's sustainable. This is, from a scientific perspective, is uh, there's some form of a consensus around it yet, but it's not like a hard science core evidence, etc. It has to be considered as such. It is to drive the process. It's an objective to drive the process, and it should be reminded as such. That's exactly what I'm reminding my scientists. <laughs> <laughs> but we do, we do like target. We do like when we cross and we tick the box. <laughs> Um, Bram, if you don't mind, let me turn to, uh, to you now. Like, it's not like the EU hasn't done anything in the, in the past, absolutely not. We've been through the story, of, for instance, of the Circular Economy Action Plan, and even more recently, uh, we've had the uh, Sustainable Product Regulations, the Eco-Design, that's also been mentioned by uh, Marlasse as one of the key aspects of tackling circular economy matters going upstream, and the product passport that come um, work with it. I was hoping that you could start by outlining how this legislation could support decreasing our material use, for instance, and perhaps how it fits into the broader EU legislative framework at the moment. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll briefly introduce myself. I, I uh, work for the... I'm not sure it's uh, working. Ah, it's not working? It's working, huh? sorry. Maybe you should hold it a bit closer. I work for the Belgian Federal Administration um, in the Environmental Product Policy Unit. Um, we are competent for uh, regulating the placing on the market of products. And I'm more of a 
technical expert. Um, I don't take these high-level decisions, um, but I'm in, in uh, the Eco-Design Committee, uh, and uh, there we work on product policies, regulating refrigerators, televisions, smartphones, so the Commission has a very uh, nice mandate in the current Eco-Design regulation, where they can tackle energy-related products, focusing heavily on climate change, energy efficiency, uh, security of supply, obviously, so uh, we're working on that, but we can regulate, in fact, any aspect. Um, and indeed, the, the last decade, uh, we actually came a long way. Um, um, I, I found back uh, uh, a kind of non-paper uh, I wrote with a Dutch uh, and German colleague or colleagues uh, on uh, how to tackle non-energy related aspects in eco-design. Um, and there you have basically, I think, three aspects you can look at. Maybe you forgot one, but I'll start with that one then. Longevity of products, uh, having reliable and repairable products to, to create long life, long circular loops of lifetime. Uh, and if you want to have them circular, I guess, even lacking that definition that you mentioned, uh, they should be designed in this recyclable way. Uh, which is something we can look at, but it's not, not that easy always. Um, and of course, you can have uh, recycled content. Um, you can have minimum eco-design would be legislation that could set minimum limits on the amount of, amount of recycled material that needs to be in certain products or components. Um, basically, we can write down whatever you want, but then, of course, member states will start uh, nagging about, yes, but it has to be verifiable and we have to do market surveillance on this and industries will say, yeah, it's not fair because our competitors in third countries will have difficulties and then you get in very interesting discussions. So these things go, go slow. But as I said, so in end October 2015, we already were thinking on that um, because it was newly introduced and we, we were asked to think on that. And then in the meantime, um, uh, the, the the last uh, uh, victory was uh, the the smartphone uh, regulation, eco design smartphone regulation, and the energy labeling regulation. Then they will enter into application next somewhere next year. But um, there you have requirements for the manufacturers placing those products on the market to have available spare parts uh, and information for consumers or only for professional. Um, repairers, there are uh, certain requirements for uh, ruggedness. The phones have to withstand a number of drops in a laboratory tests where they are tumbled around and then afterwards inspected for scratches and dents and if they power up as normal. So these kind of things can be, test, uh, can be tested. It's not always easy, um, but it can be done. And more importantly, um, there was a French initi initiative to have a repairability, uh, an indice reparability, repairability index uh, for certain products. Belgium is copying that. I don't think the legislation is actually published, but we are copying the French legislation. And that, uh, then that those member state initiatives then pushed the Commission also to, to look at the repairability index, for example, for smartphones. Uh, they're also looking at computers and, and, and laptops. Tablets are regulated together with the smartphones, tumble dryers. So this, was, this is something that will be replicated. Um, there's quite detailed text on that. Um, and uh, what also made this possible, which you also mentioned, I think, also was standards. Um, there was a standardization mandate, M543, an easy one to remember, uh, that gave rise to a series of standards uh, for triple five and then a small number, for example, four, which is the one on repairability. Uh, and in that, I participated in that standardization process, and that standard in, in one of the annexes has a, a list of basic tools or commonly available tools. Uh, I forgot now how we exactly, uh, what, what name we coined for that, but it's a closed list with, with indicative pictures, what they are, of pliers and, uh, and, and wenches and stuff. Um, that are considered like um, the easiest tool set to do repair. So uh, if your repair can be done with that tool set, then it's an easy repair. So that's something that you can use in legislation 
where you can refer for those smartphones, okay, if you uh, magnifying glass, some tweezers, a screwdriver, if you can repair it with that, then you know that it's an easily replaceable battery, for example. Um, and also as Belgium, um, maybe, well, we have the, the, the Benelux, um, and already, f I think in 2018, we had a Benelux study on uh, repairability of vacuum cleaners um, and washing machines. We worked together with um, uh, Bosch Siemens, uh, I think the Belgian Vito did the study, uh, and with Philips from the Netherlands, looking at some real products, and then uh, Vito, the research institution, they, they looked, okay, uh, what do we know about failures? Can you find spare parts, information? Um, and if you module failures of the product and do the repairs, uh, does it make sense for the consumer? And uh, fi in financial terms, and it did. So there's all these kinds of uh, little pieces of the puzzle, um, that white paper, that study, uh, the commission initiatives, and those are now uh, yeah, giving standard wording on, uh, on a repair uh, index. Um, there are other examples, the green claims, uh, the end of life vehicles review that are green claims initi initiative, uh, environmental uh, end of life vehicles uh, uh, legislation that are being reviewed. But we, we've had the batteries regulation, the critical raw materials act, and those indeed contain uh, requirements on, on, uh, on or envisage requirements on, on recycled content. Um, EcoDesign will be looking at photovoltaic panels to do something similar. Um, and one I didn't mention yet, uh, the carbon footprint, also something that we can, that will be regulated for certain batteries and could be regulated in EcoDesign. But that, so we're, we, come, we came a long way and uh, the next decade we will learn a lot because these legislations are running, um, high level decisions have been taken, uh, le so legislations have been uh, adopted, but they contain a lot of uh, secondary legislation that will in the coming years need to be developed, um, carbon footprinting rules that need to be adopted, templates, uh, the digital product passport that needs to be uh, uh, in, st yeah, in store, developed, um, and all, all these initiatives will actually, I think, take up uh, a fairly, if not all, big chunk of my time and my colleagues' time uh, to, to develop. So there, there's a, uh, a lot of stuff that will go wrong and will be learned in the coming decade. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ram. And uh, I have to say, uh, I had the chance to be part of a, of, a, of a workshop organized by your colleagues on the, in the preparation of the Belgian presidency and on the kind of, and I was very, very pleasantly surprised by the level of ambition that the Belgian presidency was putting on resource management with the idea to actually have very concrete recommendations, very concrete text into the uh, council conclusions in, uh, in May. So I wanted to, to really commend the, the Belgian presidency for that and of course rest assured that we're here to, to support that. Um, that, um, that particular process. I can come back on that in the second round, I guess. Uh, by all means, I'll, be, I'll get back to you. Okay, I'll take you up on that point. I'll get back to you on that. <laughs> uh, but first, uh, please, Nazare, I would like to, to turn to you now. Uh, we've mentioned several uh, legislation uh, initiatives at the EU level and perhaps, uh, and perhaps beyond uh, related to one way or another to, uh, to material use. There's a very new uh, kid in the block, the ECRMI, which was adopted, uh, I think, just last, uh, just last week, finally. It deals with uh, critical raw materials, so I don't want to make Yanis too uh, nervous, but uh, we've had the chance to work on that also at IEP, and actually we relate a lot to what has just been said, because it's not just about the circularity of the material. It is important, but it's not the only thing. When we talk about uh, CRMs, we need to talk about extraction, we need to talk about circularity, circular gaps, and so on. We need to talk about external supply and the impact that our demand may have on other, other countries in the world. And we have to talk about sufficiency and reduction of our consumption models, perhaps. This, with, these four pillars are necessary together if we want to actually meet the expected booming demand in these, uh, in these areas. So actually, sorry, I don't want to digress, but I want, hoping that you could uh, walk us through that particular piece of legislation. What's your take on it? How do you feel it addresses the issues, or if at all, and uh, in what sense? the addresses the issues at stake. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, well, just to tell that I, I work more on the research part. 
and uh, how to make and how to develop techniques to improve recover and ultimately recycling of, of these materials. And now going back and trying to put and to connect some pieces of, of the um, latest uh, speech. Of course, uh, the Critical Raw Materials Act, it's a, a part of the situation. Of course, we know that every day we need different materials. It's not about just the 34 uh, critical raw materials and the 17 strategic raw materials, of course. It's a broad range. Uh, perhaps the Critical Raw Materials Act appeared as, in fact, a consequence of the market, a consequence of the supply risk, obviously the part of the dependence uh, of Europe and, of course, the international policy and everything that was connected with trade systems and what has been developed with some countries that have uh, some materials and at some, some, some point there were problems about exports or trading. So perhaps this also started to increase awareness um, inside uh, the, 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 the Europe, inside the Commission, and started to kick off this, uh, potentially this situation. So, um, as it was mentioned, uh, there are different uh, approaches uh, explained uh, in this Critical Raw Materials Act that was adopted by the Commission nine days ago, so it's very, very fresh. And it mainly focuses on different uh, levels, extraction, processing, uh, recycling, and also diversifying uh, import sources. Uh, the, the question about developing targets, what was already discussed, what is the value, what is the, the, the driver of the value, the, that uh, the value has consensus. For example, if uh, for extraction we are talking about 10%, For processing inside or within Europe, we are talking about 40%. And if we are talking about recycling, we are talking about 25%. Recycling will not solve the situation, obviously. Uh, obviously, it's on the plateau level that it could uh, perhaps uh, uh, help. But even though it's an ambitious target, because the recycling rates, if we thought, think about rare earth elements, if we think about tungsten, cobalt, uh, you name it, the recycling rates and the substitution rates, they are extremely low. So thinking about 25% is super, super, super ambitious, even for the technical level. So as I mentioned, I, I work more on this part of research and trying to provide alternatives. But one, one thing that um, I think it's of um, it's super important, it was mentioned today in the morning as well, it's a part of communication. In fact, there is a need of communication, um, research and development. They, uh, they need to provide the tools for the pilot scales, for the industry uh, to perhaps start to apply. Uh, at the same time, uh, if we aim the green transition and the digital transition, <laughs> Of course, we, we, sh we, as Europe, we should think that we should support the different actors. We should talk with industry because things will change if we are talking about uh, substitution, if we are talking about recycling, if we are talking about different targets and different production uh, or adjusted production processes. But also talk with communities, with uh, public, and try to, in, in fact, for example, increase trust. And this sense, perhaps, is also uh, one of the, sometimes I use the, um, an image that um, I also work with pollution control, and normally I say that, of course, as it states a lot of the time, pollution knows no borders. This means that if a river is polluted in one member state, it will affect the other member state. And it's the same either for materials or for resources in, in general, it's the same as this sense of units that um, help. But um, at the same time, if we think about making Europe a kind more autonomous on this supply and thinking about um, 
more uh, sustainable, let's say, practices. At the same time, uh, we know that the member states, they are at different levels, okay? So at this point, I would say that, um, as we know from the Green Deal and other uh, frameworks and policies and guidelines, the concept of leave no one behind is uh, extremely important also in this case. So uh, all the member states can try to work um, in coherence and try to um, uh, capacitate the others that are struggling for the green transition. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nazare. And indeed, these are very, very important considerations that we need to keep in mind, especially if we want to work with the private sector, who will be driving, eventually, uh, fundamental actors driving the change. Uh, I don't know if you were here this morning, when the barometer presentations that I've made, the private sector, both large scale and SMEs, were actually on top of the line as the kind of most fundamental actors to actually be part of this, uh, of this process. So this is crucial and needs to be uh, reminded regularly. So thank you so much, Nazari, for, for this. Last but certainly not least, Joe, I'm turning out to you now, with uh, the same sort of uh, kind of big picture questions that I've asked last at the, at the beginning of, uh, of the session of, you know, that UNOMA has also worked extensively on the matter, on circular economy matters in, in general. So I was wondering you could give us your views on your latest findings and what you think is at the heart of the, of the problem. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you. Um, so yeah, UNOMIA has been working with the Commission on Circular Economy and Fiscal Reform for the last 23 years, pretty much continuously on circular economy files for the last 15, including quite a lot of the work on uh, Yanis' on uh, 2014 package. We follow a theory of change which is based on the idea that system change won't happen without changing the economic rules. And Obviously, there is a lot that can be done voluntarily by business, by, by public procurers, but we're unashamed believers in the need for regulatory reform to, to, to happen, to drive that systemic level change. And therefore, we're unashamed supporters of, of the EU's efforts to, to, to deliver uh, that, that reform. We focus on all planetary boundaries, but I'm going to mostly talk about looking through the climate lens now. Um, you know, we, we know we need to get to net zero, but we need to get there before we bust the carbon budget. We have to do those two things together, and that creates an urgency which isn't recognized in our current trajectory. Um, we're not on track, or we're nowhere near on track. And obviously reducing primary material extraction, processing, and use is absolutely fundamental to doing that, as we've heard throughout the day. The pace of change at the EU level isn't where it needs to be. And we've, even though we've had, a, in a way, a very uh, politically impressive commission mandate, just looking at things like the very <coughs> Uh, limited scope of the revisions to the waste framework directive and the targets in the in the packaging and packaging waste directive uh, regulation which are substantially substantially below where they need to be to put us on a on a, on a 1.5 degree trajectory um, we're we're not managing to provide the the medium term vision that is actually working backwards from where we need to get to and uh, putting, be, being, being honest about uh, where we need to be in the, in the 2030s and 2040s. Some member states are obviously going further um, and we, in, including um, setting these um, material consumption reduction targets that we were hearing about earlier. And that is to be welcomed, but obviously runs the risk of fragmenting the single market. And so it would, it would clearly be much better to be doing that kind of thing um, at uh, an EU level. Um, however, going beyond just setting targets, we really believe that 
a wider regulatory framework is required. Because if we just set targets, we're going to end up being less effective. We're going to take longer to meet those targets. We're going to be less efficient. It's going to cost us more to reach those targets. And we're going to be more socially disruptive than we need to be. And so today, Unomia is, is launching a, a report. It's funded by uh, the Mindaroo Foundation, by um, the Norwegian Retailers Environment Fund, TOMRA, uh, and Zero Waste Europe. And really what this is trying to do is set out a, I guess, an integrated, doing a little bit similar to the, uh, the, the, the OVAM study, uh, arguably, depending on how you look at it, more ambitious or less realistic. Uh, so you'd have to have a look. It's on our website today and be the judge of that. But our approach has really been to try and work backwards from a 1.5 degree trajectory. Where do we need to be at different points in, in, the, in the medium and, and longer term? And to take a carbon budgeting view of that, a materials carbon budgeting view. What we're proposing builds on what we, what we have. Uh, so existing uh, EU, the existing legislation and, and frameworks, expanding, linking, and amending uh, to deliver a much more uh, integrated approach. And fundamentally, really uh, leveraging the power of the single market in a much more conscious way to deliver these the, the objectives uh, that we need to, to, to set. There's a number of more novel approaches as well, but it's broadly trying to build on, on the, the history of, of what we have. A key theme is providing greater clarity and simplification for business through harmonization. And that means transferring some decision-making competencies from member state level to, to, to the EU and to the Commission. And obviously that's difficult and controversial, but we don't really see an alternative to doing more of that, and I think it's, it's important to be honest about that. In terms of some of the, the rest of the detail, uh, we start with decarbonizing production, so that's for us about leveraging the, the ETS and the CBAM, expanding the scope of both, tightening the cap, um, and uh, really using those to continue to drive decarbonization of, of production. And obviously, uh, incentivizing uptake of, of secondary materials, et cetera. Then on product policy, um, again, harmonization is really important here. Uh, integration of measures to support these sustainable forms of consumption, leading to fewer, better designed products, lasting longer, getting more utilized, being more repairable, reusable, and ultimately being being re relatively easily recyclable and likely to be recycled into things that will go through that, that whole uh, cycle again. A significant addition to the policy toolbox, which, which you'll like, uh, is an EU level product taxation uh, instrument. This is obviously a big political step, but we think is necessary to drive the change at scale that we need. We also focus on maintaining value of material at end of life. And here we're proposing reform to the, the waste hierarchy, uh, introducing uh, a recycling hierarchy, uh, a, uh, a bioresources hierarchy, and a residual waste hierarchy to really drive conservation of materials and to minimize um, negative uh, impacts of waste management as well. And to bring all of this together, we're proposing an overarching directive to guide society's use of materials. A materials framework directive that would replace the waste framework directive and would introduce additional measures such as material taxation at EU level, again, obviously requiring a, a change of powers uh, to, to the status quo, 
a duty on member states to minimize material use, recognizing the fact that not everything is appropriate for harmonization, um, and using the right materials for the right applications. And so we've developed the concept of a materials application hierarchy that could help to provide that framework. Of course, we're not blind to the political realities of uh, discussions about greater centralization of powers and taxation. Um, and there, there are lots of uh, ideas in this proposal which are, are going to be contentious. Um, and we have to recognize that popular support is particularly important in these times of uh, certainly pushback from member states and at EU level to some of the Commission's existing green agenda. So, uh, yeah, that has to be acknowledged, but luckily it's not our role to actually deliver this legislation. Uh, we're really here to, to hopefully put forward uh, some, some constructive ideas. But in terms of the prize for long-term competitiveness for, for the EU economy, not to mention the safeguarding, the well-being of future generations and our cohabiting species, this is too important to risk failure. And I think one of the challenges now, uh, particularly in the, the, um, the inter-mandate period, is to provide the evidence to really support uh, this, both in terms of the science and the political argumentation and the, the means of getting citizens on board. Thank you so much, Joe. And the very good news in this is that for policymakers, there's, there's no shortage of uh, recommendations, policy recommendations. So um, I think it's always good to go to have an informed debate and, and decision. Um, we have something like Half an hour later, we'll go back to for a second round of questions and then perhaps open the floor to the, to the audience. Um, but yeah, quite quickly, let's say I would like to try and, and uh, I'm turning to you now and trying to wrap up some of the notions that you, you've mentioned in your six bullet points. So you've talked about recycled content and the uh, design phase and et cetera, which are arguably already tackled in some way or form by EU legislations, data flowing, product passports and, um, and the like. Standards and definition, I would love to get back on that, but I hope, I hope we'll have the time, but I'm not, I'm not so, so sure. But in here, what I see in this debate a lot is the, the kind of tension, it shouldn't be, but the tension between ambition and being realistic enough for the public, uh, for the policymakers to actually embark on the, on the journey. And linked to that, two of your points pertains to money. You mentioned the public procurement, you've mentioned shifting the tax base. So in your mind, how can we do, as these two, I would like to ask you to expand a little bit more on these two points in particular, and in your mind, how really, uh, do you think that we have at our disposal the means, the financial means and capacity to actually drive this particular economic transformation that we need? Thank you, an, an excellent question. I think we're talking here about two sides of the same coin. Uh, the, 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 the one side being that all action starts here and now and starts from the circumstances that are present today. And the other side of the coin is that unless you have a clear and ambitious goal towards which you aim, aim all your actions, you don't know where you are going and you don't get coordinated action. So I think we need, need both, both of the strands touched upon in the, in the discussion we've already had. We, we need the clear and ab ambitious targets to enable us to go where no EU has gone before. But still, we need to start with actions that can be accomplished with the mandate that's politically possible for the next commission period, for the next, next parliament period. And uh, we have been looking more at those policy levers that can be uh, with, with which we can start work now or in the next one or two years. But that doesn't mean we don't, the, the only answer that can succeed in, in tackling this challenge is a systemic one. And that means we, I wholeheartedly agree that we have to change the whole incentive structure in order to make this work. Uh, and, and in that, we, we, I, one of the points I'd, I'd really like to expand is that taxation is not the only fiscal instrument we can use to change the incentive structures. We can also look at the other 
potential pricing mechanism. We're, we're, what we're talking about here is how to set a price on externalities, how to internalize externalities into both private sector and public sector decision making. And with, we've experimented quite heavily in Europe with one key pressure we're, we're putting on nature systems, our carbon emissions. We have the ETS, we have all the carbon pricing mechanisms in store. The next phase is to set up an ambitious and, and effective pricing mechanism for other major pressures we put on nature systems, not just the carbon, but also the other four drivers of biodiversity loss, in particular our land use. Commission has said, already said a decade ago to, uh, that we're going to get back to how we could put, put in place an effective European steering mechanism, uh, uh, which could include, for instance, biodiversity offsets in the mix. And, well, we have many national attempts at, uh, at putting a price tag on land use effects created by human activity. We have the, Germany has had biodiversity uh, offsets legislation since 1970s, for instance, but we don't have a European approach to that. And then we have, of, of course, traditional issues like pollution, one, one, another of the key drivers of biodiversity loss, of nature loss, and, uh, and there they are other policy instruments that could, could be used to effectively, effectively drive the price tag to pollutants. For instance, looking outside Europe, for instance, the city of Melbourne in Australia, when seeing that the uh, eutrophication of the waters around Melbourne was getting pretty intensive, uh, Melbourne set a price tag on nitrogen emissions. And in the decade or so that's followed, you, 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 I'm told that you've seen a complete transformation of how new urban construction in Melbourne happens because there's a price tag and you need that if you want to cut the price uh, as an urban developer, you have to uh, have the protective, protective measures that prevent the nitrogen runoff. And these are, there's a whole policy mix of pricing instruments that you can use, not just taxation, and we are producing a report at CITRA due to be published this year in which we are collecting uh, a case study of potential pricing mechanisms from different cases around the globe which could be of use either to local or regional or national policy makers. And so I think the challenge is big enough that we have to gather all the tools possible and then start sense making of what is politically possible to deliver. Thank you so much. And yeah, putting a price on externalities will certainly be a fundamental driver of, of change. I mean, of course, I would like also to point on the UCRA, the EU climate risk assessments, which are pretty much internalizing, for mentioning the cost of inaction, climate cost of inaction. That's also something to be, to be considered in, a, in that sense. Uh, Bram, I think the audience will be annoyed at me if I don't get back to you and uh, about your promise to talk okay. a bit about the, the Belgian presidency. I kind of promised, I, I guess. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. Sorry for uh, keeping you in suspense. Uh, but indeed, you, you mentioned, um, uh, I don't know when the council exactly is because I'm not uh, involved in the first line of, of preparing this, so I have some wonderful colleagues doing that. Uh, but indeed, I read a, a draft of it, and uh, it's 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 ambitious, uh, and it it indeed it it calls to some kind of uh, EU resource uh, management law, um, because it's necessary uh, to get it on the agenda because material and resource efficiency are necessary also to meet our climate goals. Um, so uh, that will be discussed. Um, there is, uh, of course, this, this politically, Belgian law proposes, but it's politically contentious in the sense that uh, you have decoupling, you have relative decoupling, absolutely, absolute decoupling, um, and uh, dematerialization and efficiency and sufficiency. So um, I think, uh, uh, I don't know how the dis discussion will go. I cannot uh, look into the head of, of uh, more important people than me, uh, heads of state and ministers, uh, but the discussion uh, will turn around that. Um, uh, I would also like to add um, that it has been mentioned, but this, uh, these are the my, my, my personal uh, opinions more. 
that uh, the just transition is necessary. Um, of course, uh, I, I explain I work for the, uh, in an, an energy efficiency domain, product policy. There's one, it's only one segment. There are many options, many, many uh, policy fields that can, can contribute. So also in that sense, you need um, this overarching uh, uh, strategy uh, to give uh, direction uh, to um, to other policies, uh, if you can have national action plans, if you can have indicators, all that kind of stuff, um, climate change policies, maybe all over again, but for for material. Um, so um, I think that is is what such a, such a resource efficiency uh, law should also do: is is uh, institutionalizing things. Uh, framing things, um, yeah, has been said that it's not something that happens ad hoc, uh, and that it doesn't depend depend on persons like Franz Timmermans for the winter package for eco design, for example. But that it's really something um, that has to be looked at. So that's uh, that's an important aspect. And then I mentioned climate uh, policy and energy policy. I could imagine that that you, if if we want to go that way, that you could look at uh, at some some uh, maybe triple bottom line, if you can call it that way. That you have a, a reduction target, uh, you have an efficiency target, uh, like uh, monitoring consumption and putting a cap on it, having an efficiency target, doing more with less, and maybe have a target when you source uh, actual material. Um, that you do it in the most sustainable way, like recycled content, bio-based renewable, um, uh, reuse of parts. So th those are uh, maybe things that you could look at. But as I said, this is more of my, my personal opinion now, but um, it, it is a, a timely to have, a, to have this proposal. So I hope I can at least, I, I, that I at least answered some of, mm -hmm. of the questions on that. Yes. Absolutely, thank you so much. And it's good to hear that the, the Belgian presidency is actually I mean, doubling down on its uh, on its ambition. And uh, rest assured, I think I speak for everyone around here that we'll be here to support you in a, in any way that we that we can. Um, okay, we could we could speak for hours. Uh, honestly, I have so many questions that I would like to ask you, but I also would like to, to give the audience the chance to, to be involved. So Nazare, Joe, Yanis, unless there's a specific point that you would like to make uh, at the moment, um, just one very quick thing to say, which is that I think we. Um, we need to consider the, n the potential r need to go beyond internalizing environmental externalities if we want to drive the system change that we're talking about. That sometimes internalizing externalities isn't enough to send a strong enough price signal and that we, 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 we need to recognize that and not be economic purists about this, but recognize where we need to get to and be, be ready to potentially go beyond that envelope. Three quick comments. Uh, if I start with, with that where you, uh, I, I'm, I'm otherwise professor of, of economics, so bear with me. Uh, it's uh, whenever I try to explain the layman's, I'm trying to say something like production capital, it's and financial, it's overvalued and our reward it labor it's undervalued and under rewarded and uh, nature it's unfortunately not valued and if you put it in the economic system markets we know where it where it goes so don't be surprised if we are living in social economic and environmental imbalances because that's exactly what we are asking producers and consumers to come as an outcome so that's basically what we ask them <coughs> And uh, uh, indeed, uh, uh, for me, th when you mentioned tax system, I was pretty, pretty happy to hear that. Because one of the core things which I learned is that if it, there is anybody in the government who doesn't know what is their role is financial ministers. Because they think that their role is keeping the budget in balance, but actually it's a bit more than that. So they are actually driving the producers and consumers' behavior. And with everything, with all the structures, with all the... So, but uh, leave, it, leave it there. So uh, just two very short comments. One is actually a joke. Uh, one of the major paradoxes which I've seen is that uh, all politicians are always requesting to provide them with opportunities and barriers. Yeah, that w that's always. We need opportunities and barriers, but the major barrier is actually political feasibility. 
So it's really paradoxical that they don't understand they are the major barrier. Yeah. And, and at the same time when they want to be provided with that. And, and finally, Bram, that's the answer to you. And that's actually a joke. Uh, the council will be in the first half of this year. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's because colleagues were always uh, somehow teasing me when I was in commission that commission is always providing answers which are absolutely correct but useless. <laughs> All right, now you, you have a date, Bram. <laughs> All right, then if I can please turn to the floor. We have one question here, then, okay, two, Emily. Andreas Briga, SME United, the voice of small and medium enterprises. We've been mentioned a lot um, uh, in your first uh, panel and now. Um, I, I'm, I'm very, very fascinated, interested by, um, by your elaborations. I'm not sure that all of my members would be um, super enthusiastic about another framework law. Um, if you can put yourself in, in that position, what argument would you have to convince them to jump on board? Um, my name is Christian Hai. I'm a, a director in the Hessian Ministry responsible for the circular economy and uh, pollution control and at the same time a, a SAC member of IEP. Uh, uh, my responsibility is to put the system change on, on the ground. And I have many, many questions and comments, but I, I just want to raise one. Uh, uh, nobody from you mentioned the, one of the critical barriers to a circular economy, which is chemicals pollution, which is hazardous chemicals. Uh, this is one of the missing points of the Green Deal agenda uh, where the Commission failed to deliver uh, and it is crucial without uh, cleaning the products you can't get into the circular economy and I think that is a huge barrier. We are discussing presently uh, uh, end-of-life definitions uh, for building waste and the key problem is uh, uh, if the building waste is full of chemicals Let's just start with asbestos, which is in every breach, uh, which is in many old buildings, etc. Uh, if you don't uh, have a solution uh, for getting asbestos out of, of the building materials, you, you cannot reuse it. Uh, you have to, to just dump it. And that is one of the big, big barriers. And therefore, uh, the linkage between chemicals policy and resource policy must be much more strengthened in the debate, uh, and I would like to uh, hear your opinion on this. Thank you. Thank you. Emily Stewart, Global Witness. Um, Nazari, you sort of alluded to the idea of building trust with the people of Europe around this. And I wanted to pose a question about that trust and how we have an honest conversation with citizens to get them behind these plans. I think if we look at the narrative as it's developed so far, what we're basically telling people is that as long as they electrify their vehicle and put a solar panel on their roof, they're doing their part towards stopping climate change. And I think that most of my reading, and I'm sure some of your research will agree, that we cannot possibly have a situation where every single person in just Europe has an electric vehicle and a solar panel on their roof without massively overshooting planetary boundaries. So how do we have that honest conversation with people who've been told one story to lead them to a point where hopefully we can agree that what we need moving forward is much more of a shared transition rather than an individual one so that resources can be shared more evenly? Thank you. Yes, thank you. My name is Artie Ten Wolde. I have actually four questions, if there's not enough time. I have put them all in the, in the chat. <laughs> and the first one is uh, that uh, Ecopreneur is very enthusiastic about the, uh, fully supports the idea to have uh, these, these goals. In fact, I'm not even sure if they're not already there, but they should be there. There should be goals for uh, using less resources. We support that, but why a new law? The same question that SME United uh, post. Um, because what we really need is these incentives uh, to create a level playing field. I'm very happy with everything you said, um, Lassa Mitinen, uh, because we need uh, to end fossil fuel subsidies, we need uh, EPR with eco-modulation, we need real um, the, the green public procurement, etc., etc. So how can 
you help to, to realize that. Um, for instance, instead of going to the EU level immediately for taxation, we are in support also of the tax shift from, from labor to resources, but why not start with nine countries in a coordinated action with France and with Germany as a start? Because at the EU level, it's impossible, it's blocked. And then I heard some rumor, but I'm not sure if it's true, that the European Commission is drafting a new a proposal on green public procurement. Is that true? Because we would be really interested. Um, and, and yeah, to, to Joe Papeski, how would you imagine a uh, product a taxation uh, happen as long as it's blocked by the council? All right, many questions to answer. Administration, administrative burden for SMEs, hazardous chemicals, citizens trust and shared transitions, and incentives for level playing field slash level of governance, slash uh, green procurement issues. Opening the floor, panelists, would you like to take on one of these questions or several? First answer in one sentence, you, okay, we can talk about law or not law, but without material story, you will not solve climate, biodiversity, water, pollution, or any other crisis, full stop. If that's not good enough convincing to you, live with the crisis. So chemical pollution, you are absolutely right. Absolutely. So that's, uh, uh, by the way, UNEP has established a new scientific panel exactly in the, clim in the uh, chemicals, uh, which we sincerely hope that will be a kind of push. If I would be a bit, uh, uh, not know how to say it, one of the problems of Europe is that we are, stronger exactly in those industries which are most exposed to transition pressures, which is chemicals and car industry. Uh, we are the strongest there. And it's, that's why some, somehow, for me, it's even surprising that we are going so far and so quick uh, on the basis of the fact which I've mentioned. Uh, and uh, uh, there was a question about um, um, system approach. So the, the whole idea, it's exactly that. We, uh, if you would look to our report, we don't talk about car, we talk about mobility. Because if you look through the car perspective, you end up with replacing, exactly with that. But if you look it through the mobility, it's totally different answer. Because you have many of the options and I'm absolutely convinced if you would give, because it's about options. If you would give people more options for that, you would need, of course, very, very much organized organized approach to those questions, then they would act uh, totally differently, in particular with the young generation and everything which I have mentioned before. Yeah, um, three brief answers to small and medium-sized enterprises. Uh, personally, I'm pretty agnostic about the question of law, no law. We just need somewhere to enshrine the targets. But, uh, but I think my, my main, main point that I always make when speaking with small and medium-sized enterprises is that you guys have the innovative solutions to the most pressing problems of the planet and society today, and now it's up to the policymakers to make sure that there is the demand for them, that you, you've got the, either public or private uh, actors who, who, who intend to buy the solutions that you produce and create a thriving business around the solutions that you have. Um, how to get the citizens on board. I think there are so many things when it comes to circularity where the interests are personal interests of citizens and the wider economy and circular economy combined. For instance, the idea that we ought to have, we, we ought to have products that do not expire in two years. We ought to have products that are lasting, that are made to last and easy to repair. That's a no-brainer to most people and something that, they were, that people are eager to accept. And as for the, uh, wh what to do when the situation in the council is blocked, I'm 100% in favor of the idea that if reality is messy, I'm pretty willing to accept that the responses can be messy too. So we'll just uh, assemble a coalition of willing and use that to drive the process forward and let the perfect system come afterwards. I have no idea what you mean with messy in terms of EU policy making <laughs> process. <laughs> Just um, so the pitch to SMEs, um, I think there's two immediate angles for me. One is SMEs are driving innovation more than any other part of the economy. And two, we're talking here about 
a system change towards more local economic development. Those are both two huge opportunities for SMEs. I'm not saying that that's, you know, I'm generalizing and I'm not saying it's easy to, to communicate that, but I think really this is a, a big opportunity for SMEs. Uh, I think in terms of engaging with citizens, uh, it's, we're, we're so disconnected from citizens in these uh, policy processes. Uh, I, you know, I think what citizens actually are being told at the moment is it's not just an, uh, an EV, it's a two ton SUV, you know, electric SUV. And that's c completely the opposite direction to where we need to be heading and, where, and we need to create narratives that actually demonstrate benefits to, to consumers and citizens that make sense to them. And that is possible, but we're not really trying to do it. Totally agree on chemicals. Um, we did the, the work behind the impact assessment on the packaging, packaging waste regulation. Um, chemicals risks were out of scope. Uh, so in terms of how disconnected these processes so often are, I have to answer the direct question on uh, what, what, uh, how you deliver half of what I've uh, just outlined. I mean, I think the purpose of what we published today is to set out, I mean, it's not in any way perfection. It's, it's, a, it's, it's one conception of how to, how we, what, we, what we could aim for. Um, and there isn't a timeline. You know, what, do I have huge confidence that the next commission mandate is gonna be able to deliver you know, any of the major pieces of that? Well, right now I'm not feeling, feeling that's that likely. Um, but the role of this is to try to set out a vision um, and I totally agree on, uh, you know, actually where we are right now is that member states are running faster than, than the EU in lots of areas. Innovation's being driven there. It's complete chaos. It's not how we would ideally like it to be, but uh, we've got to grab progress where we can get it. Yeah, maybe on the, uh, the SME uh, Federation. Um, I mentioned Philips uh, and another big company earlier, but uh, I also personally also did a project with a Belgian uh, SME that make lighting products. Uh, to they were, uh, but the project was actually helping them develop uh, products as lighting as a service uh, business model, which they did. And embarrassingly, uh, I forgot their name now. It doesn't want to leave to mind. Um, but indeed, this is a, was a company that was had some knowledge about this, was ready to do this, uh, and we had a budget and a project to, to work on that, and we, with a consultant, we helped them. Um, and they, uh, they put this business model into the market. Um, so indeed, SMEs are important, and they're very innovative. Um, and I think, as has been said, um, uh, we have this role as a government to deal with crises, and yeah, the, the, we have a role to play there. and. Um, uh, all businesses alike, uh, we need to uh, onboard them in these projects. Uh, and sometimes SMEs are maybe more at an advantage as inno innovative and smaller companies to take quicker decisions and be uh, more flexible to adapt than maybe than bigger companies. So um, that's what I would like to answer. And uh, maybe add to that that in eco design, uh, I've always enjoyed working together with stakeholders, uh, including industry. So I think uh, that is definitely not the issue. Uh, well, in, in my view, thank you. Short, short. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Thanks for uh, uh, just two, two comments. Uh, the first one about chemicals. I think it's a, a, a severe problem here. And not only for materials, but also for other matrices. If we think about water, for example, the watching list that is uh, adjusted every two years, and still uh, there are uh, lots of situations that should be solved. So, for example, that is far uh, behind in terms of development of specific targets. And um, it's, it's definitely one thing that uh, it should be taken into account as a cross-cutting problem, I would say. In, in terms of the, the speaking with people, and, and thanks for the, for the comment, very, very uh, useful, of course. The, I would say that the main idea is to try to increase awareness. 
Of course, in consumption, we are talking about these. You, you, there was the example about the car. But in fact, it's not to increase or to provide alarm to people. It's to explain them that there are options, as the example of the car and the mobility. And I think that it's better uh, if we say that we potentially will have a problem or we are still facing a potential crisis or a potential problem. And if we provide the options, then perhaps the transition will happen because we are not just talking in the, in the vacuum and talking about problems. We are providing alternatives to people and we are providing potentially um, a support for, to change some actions and behaviors. So, yeah, I think that's all. Thank you so much, Nazareth. And with that, I think we've covered, hopefully, uh, a decent share of the issue at stake. So, Nazareth, Ram, Lassie, Joe, Yanis, thank you so much for your participation. Thank you to all for attending this particular session. And now, we have, I think we've run a bit over time, so if you want to grab a quick coffee, but otherwise there is a closing panel that will start in, in, in not so long. Yeah, thank you back once in again. the auditorium, please. Yes, I am.